You're listening to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Big John McCarthy has witnessed the best that the UFC had to offer. That is it! Game, set, and we have a new champion! Your backstage pass to the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Let's get it on! Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and me, Sean Wheelock. Every week on this podcast, John and I give you an inside look at MMA and combat sports, always separating fact from fiction. This week on the program, we're coming to you from Windstar World Casino and Resort in Thackerville, Oklahoma, here for Bellator MMA. But our focus is on last week's UFC in Brazil, which produced arguably the most controversial refereeing decision in the sport this year. Also on that card, John was involved in a controversy of his own as he took a point away from Demi and Maya in the closing stages of the night's main event. We'll examine those two fights, plus we'll discuss one of the most unusual verbal submissions that I've ever seen. And as we do on every episode of Let's Get It On, John will answer your questions. So ask away via email, info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. That's info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Remember that you can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. John, you're just back from Brazil, UFC Fight Night 62, where referee Eduardo Erdi made, quite frankly, a brutal mistake in the Drew Dober versus Leandro Silva fight. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's nice to be back. I, I got to be home for one day. It's awesome. Now I'm, now I'm in uh, Thackerville, Oklahoma, getting ready for Bellator, so I'm lucky, just lucky to be able to do what I get to do. But uh, we, had, we had a couple things happen there, and it's, you know, everything you know, that happens, you, you always want to take a look at it, figure out what happened, how do you make it better, how do you learn from it, and how do you move on. And that's really what, you know, the job of a referee, you got to have thick skin, and you have to you know, figure out what it is you need to do to make things better. So I think most of you listening to this podcast have probably seen either the fight live or you've at least pulled it up on MMA Core or YouTube or Daily Motion. You've seen the video. But for those who haven't or just as a refresher, let's go through this. And let's talk about it not from Dober and Silva's perspective, but from the referee's perspective, John. Well, from the referee's perspective, you're looking at, you know, Dober gets into a position where he actually is he's in half guard on top. Leandro Silva is holding on to a guillotine, but the way he's holding on to the guillotine, if you understand what's going to work and what's not, his hips are being blocked by Dober's body for him to go the way that the guillotine would be able to be tightened. The way he is, where he's at with where Dober's in his, in his position, there's no way he can tighten the guillotine. And so it's our job to understand the differences of those positions. You know, Silva needs to take and he actually needs to turn his hips towards Dober, which he can't do. And, and Dober's in a position where he can do a, several things. You know, we have chokes, you know, we have the Von Flew choke from that position. And honestly, it looked to me, I wasn't sure what Dober was going to try to do from the position in clearing his head or in trying to go to a Von Flew to see if he could actually start to put a submission onto Silva. And what happened with it, you know, his hand went down. The referee looked at it and, and believed that it was a tap. And, you know, when we're talking about the referee, we're not talking about someone that doesn't understand our sport, doesn't understand grappling. This is a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. This is not a guy that is, you know, you're going to see all kinds of things about people saying, you know, this guy doesn't know anything. Look at this guy can tear most people apart on the mat. He made a mistake. And with the mistake, you know, Drew Dober was penalized for doing what he's supposed to be doing, and a, and a fight was taken from him that possibly he could have been putting himself in position to win. Now, that doesn't mean that Drew Dober was going to win that fight. We don't know. We don't know what the outcome was going to be because it was stopped prematurely. And Drew Dober was, you know, at the moment that the fight was stopped, it was awarded to Leandro Silva, which is something that when you look at it and you look at it on tape and you look at what occurred, that wasn't a fair outcome for the fighter and things needed to be changed to make it fair for the fighter. John, as I'm watching that fight at home in Kansas City on Fox Sports, so first You're I exploding. think, <laughs> well, I, I know Drew Dober. He's from Nebraska. I'm from Kansas. I knew him from the Midwest circuit. He fought for us early on in Bellator. 
So he's holding half guard. And, and I'm thinking, first of all, Dober's not in, in a difficult position. When was the last time anybody in a high level or even a mid-level of MMA saw somebody finished with a guillotine from half guard? It's just not something that you're going to see well, a, a great deal. Well, you, you will see. You know, and this is, the, this is the understanding of body positions. You will see guys finishing people from half guard with a guillotine. Very possible. You, know, you can look at you know Nogueira. He won the interim title. You know, in the UFC against Tim Sylvia with a guillotine from the half guard, but you have to understand the positions and the positions of where the way that Nogueira did it, he was able to get his body because of where he put Sylvia and had his head on the side with the turning of his hips that starts to crank the neck and that starts to intensify the choke. Leandro Silva was not in a position to be able to do what Nogueira did, which means that his position, his half guard guillotine, if you want to call it, is completely different. And he doesn't have the ability to finish the choke where it's at. It's just not there. You have to understand those positions. And in understanding it, you know that Dober is not in trouble. He's not in a position where someone is choking him even. There's really no pressure. The pressure is is not anything that we have to be concerned with in that position that Dober was at. So, I mean, it's, it's a it's a hard game to play. And you're always, you know, this is why we, with referees, we want referees to be training. We want them to go in and we want them to do all kinds of different training, both in the stand-up and on the ground and in watching fighters and watching guys go through positions because these are all positions that occur and we have to make the right call because when we make the wrong call, it affects the fight in a very negative fashion and that's something we can't have. So as I'm continuing to watch, when I see Erdy jump in, I immediately think, well, maybe he ruled this a technical submission for some reason. Then I immediately back up as I'm watching this live. So on my DVR, you can back up in real time. And then I see the left hand of Dober post up. And then I thought, well, maybe Erdy thought that, that he had tapped out. What's interesting, Michael Buffer in the cage, or uh, rather Bruce Buffer, Buffer in the cage, said uh, the winner by way of tap out. Yeah. But on Sure Dog, this was initially listed as a technical submission, which I think even added to more confusion. You were there, so you know what happened. Did er, did Erdy think that it was a tap, or did he rule it as a technical submission? He ruled it a tap. He said that Dober tapped, and it was with the left hand post that posting. And again, this is where we need to understand if a fighter is in danger. Because you understand the position, and they are in danger. And, you, know, you can go back to you know fights, you know fights I did. You know everyone gets this idea that a fighter has to tap three times. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Okay, fighters don't have to tap three times. You've been watching way too much of WWE pro <laughs> wrestling, watching the referee taking their hand going three times. Oh, the fight's over. That is that has nothing to do. A tap is a tap is a tap, but. We'll get people saying, oh, that fighter tapped when we the referee doesn't stop it. And they'll say, oh, you missed the tap. You didn't miss a tap. The fighter was never in danger. It's not a tap. The, fight, the hand can sit there and it can actually slap, right, because they're moving their body position. They're not in danger. And that's for the referee to understand. But when someone's in danger, you, know, you can go back to Fedor against Fabricio Verdum. When Fedor hadn't lost in so long, Fabricio Verdum goes in and fights him. He ends up getting him in a triangle. He switches the triangle from an, to an arm bar, back to the triangle, and it gets to a point where Fedor is in trouble. He can't get out, and he does this one big, I call it the man tap, one tap, you know, because he was in danger. The fight's over. That's a tap. You don't have to tap three times. And people get this idea that you do. Well, we again, we need to understand when the fighter is in danger and when they're not. Because if you look at Dober and Dober post his arm, he doesn't. That's exactly what we're going to call it. We're going to say he's starting to post his arm because he's going to he's going to clear his head, and that's what the referee uh, decided was a tap on Dober's part, thinking that he was in trouble, made a mistake. And that was the end of the fight. So, John, the immediate aftermath, Dana White expresses outrage. He says that he's going to pay Drew Dober his win bonus. Which is, you know what, you look and you say, I want this to be clear to everyone. Obviously, Dober doesn't deserve a loss. But you got to really give it to the UFC for saying, hey, we're going to give you your win money. That's money that's out of their pockets. They're handing it because they got to hand it to both. They can't take it from Leandro. They they're giving that money to both, so you gotta you gotta hand it to them that they're they're treating Dober as good as they can treat him. They can't give him 
you know, the no contest. That's for the commission, the regulatory body to do. So then Drew Dober says that he's going to appeal the ruling and ask to have it changed to a no contest. But first, the Brazilian MMA Athletic Commission announced that the situation wasn't eligible to be appealed or overturned because it was a, quote, error of fact and not a, quote, error of the rule. But then that was reversed. So the Brazilian MMA Athletic Commission reversed themselves and now, I guess to put this finally to bed, said this is going to be a no contest. Absolutely. And, and you know, overall, the Brazilian, you know, the, when you're looking at the regulatory body, the Brazilian commission, they're, they're good people. You know, I went down there and I've done training with them. They want to do the right thing, but they have let what was written into their legislation is they can overturn a fight if they find out that there's any type of collusion. Someone does something to you know make it to where we have a fake fight we have someone that's been you know you know extorted for you know whatever reason all those kind of things the other reason they can take in and uh, turn the fight over is they have a breach of the rules well this wasn't a breach of the rules this was a decision on the referee that wasn't proper at the time and the other part that they can turn it over on has to do with actual the the legislation that they have and that someone tries to mess with the, the promotion and stuff and so there's not a lot that they can do to turn it over and i think they went outside of their realm and went to i know they talked to you know nick Lembo in new jersey they talked to andy foster in california you know in saying well you know what can we do with this because i think they were trying to say look we want to do what's right for the fighter but we've got to We've got to do it within our rule set. We can't change our rules and go outside of it because then we're opening up Pandora's box. And I think that they came back with the, you know, with Hurdy saying that he relieves himself of the decision of what occurred. It allowed the commission to take place and say, you know what, we're going to look at it and say that this was not the right decision by the referee. He has said there was a mistake. He has put it on us to correct the mistake. And that's what they're doing is they're correcting the mistake. They're making a no contest. And that's the right thing. Let these guys come back and fight the fight again. Every week on Let's Get It On, we have a poll question. You can cast your vote on our website, let's get it on podcast.com. So this week's poll question, should a clear error by a referee that results in the end of the fight be automatically eligible to be changed to a no contest or do you think that a referee's deci decision should always be final? Let us know what you think by voting at Let's Get It On Podcast.com. I think I know how that one's going to come. <laughs> I do too, actually. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be someone who says, no, the referee's decision should be final. And, and that's you the know, way it is. I, I can I can tell you that there's been plenty of times. I've, I've gone to fighters after fights that I've done and said, oh, hey, go and appeal this. I will write the commission. I will tell them that this is what occurred. I was wrong for this, and I will go to the commission and tell them I think the fight should be turned over into a no contest. If you're a referee, the whole thing is for you to have integrity, to be honest about what occurred. You know, we can all make mistakes, you know, and when we make a mistake, we need to look to see again how that mistake was made, what we can do to make it right, what we can do to fix it so it doesn't happen again, and we've got to move on. This is a fast sport, and there's a lot of decisions. And anyone can sit there on the outside and say, Oh, it's an easy decision when it's you that has the responsibility of the fighter's safety in your hands. It's a heavy weight to hold a lot of times. And these guys are they're worried about the fighter. They don't want the fighter to be, you know, held in a choke or anything that's beyond what it should be. And, you know, it, there's a lot of weight that comes with it. And guys making you know decisions, sometimes those decisions aren't going to be right. But we always want to try to if we do make a poor decision. We want to take and try to fix it so it doesn't happen again. John, I think the bigger picture, which has really been missed or ignored or a combination of both by the MMA media, is what this exposes, which is that depending on what country you're in or in the U.S., what state you're in, or if you're in a tribal commission here at Windstar, this Bellator show will be at a tribal commission. It really is a case-by-case -case situation. So a couple of examples. This is Brazil, all right? They have the Brazilian MMA Athletic Commission. This fight were in, in England. There is no British Boxing Board of Control. There is a British Boxing Board of Control, but, they, but not for MMA. The equivalent of one in <laughs> well, MMA, okay, there absolutely. <laughs> there is, but they're worried about boxing. Yes. So in England still, it's, it's like MMA in a lot of U.S. states in the mid and late 1990s. It's a the, promoter. The promoter brings the referee. He brings the judges. He's yep. responsible for the doctor or whatever he wants to do. So there's no fallback. 
Contrast that to, say, if you're at Mohegan Sun, which is a tribal commission in Connecticut, our great friend Mike Mazzulli does a fantastic job. What if this is California with Andy Foster, another great friend of ours? What if you're in a state like Alaska, which doesn't have an athletic commission but is still in the United States? This is really a case-by-case basis. This really kind of blows the cover off of what a lot of people just try to ignore or don't even look at in MMA. Well, this is the whole thing is, you know, we we talk about – athletic commissions and everything that you know they're doing and stuff it's so different in the fighting world than it is in you know football football has if it's professional it's the nfl basketball has the nba you know baseball major league baseball okay those are that's a business that's an organization that runs the sport the problem with you know boxing and mma kickboxing muay thai is they are run by the athletic commissions, and each state has their individual athletic commission. Some states have, you know, not only the state athletic commission, they have tribal commissions that are there with uh, sovereign land and things, and they all do things a little bit different, and they look at things a little bit different. There are, you know, commissions that have instant replay. Brazil has instant replay. Um, you know, New Jersey has instant replay. Nevada has instant replay. California has instant replay. But if you go to Iowa, they don't. If you can go to Kansas, they don't. You can go, you know, in Florida, they don't. And so this is, you know, there's just differences in the athletic commissions and there's differences in the way they handle problems. I can tell you, like in California, you know, I, there's certain fights. You know, I can go way back. Mike Aina fought Billy Evangelista in Strike Force. Herb Dean was a referee. And during it, Billy... Uh, has Mike down and he lands a knee and the knee actually lands underneath the arm, but it hits with such force that it knocks the arm and shoulder into Aina's head and Herb thought that he got kneed to the head and made a call, disqualified Billy Evangelista. And then he goes and, you know, Billy Evangelista protests. He says, man, I didn't knee him to the head and takes it to the California State Athletic Commission Herb goes to the to the meeting and says, I made a mistake. He goes, I thought the knee hit his head. You can clearly see when you watch the videotape, it lands in a legal area. It forces his own arm into his head. I think you should overturn this and make it a no contest. That was Billy Evangelista's first loss on his career. But that's Herb Dean going and being honest. And we can all make a mistake. I had a fight with Robbie Peralta against Mack and Smizers in the UFC. And if you watch the fight at real speed, no one will ever see what occurs. But if you watch it in slow motion, when they're both throwing right hands, they collide and their heads hit. Now, it's unintentional, but it it hurts Mack and Smizers to the, the point it knocks him to the ground. Robbie Peralta gets a huge hematoma, but his head is still clear, and he goes down and finishes the fight. I call the fight off of, I thought that Mackens was hit with a right hand. He was actually hurt by the, the connecting of their heads clashing together. I went to Mackens and told when I saw it in slow motion after the fight was all over and they declared the winner, I went to Mackens and told him, hey, protest this. Go and I will tell him I made a mistake. When you watch it in slow motion, you can see it is an unintentional clash of heads that caused him to be hurt. I've had it in other fights. In Bellator, I had it. Seth Petrozelli fights Mo Lal. And they clash heads, and I saw it. It knocks Seth Petrozelli down. Mo goes after him, and I stop the fight and call time. Everyone thinks I stopped the fight, and Mo was the winner, and it's new. Yeah, and I give Seth time to get himself back. I have the doctor look at him. They say he can fight. We bring the fight back because it would have been wrong for Seth to be hurt by an illegal action, even though Mo didn't do it on purpose. And for the fight to end off of it, is it's the wrong call. John, the last point on this. So... Obviously, all referees are going to make mistakes. That's MMA. Yes. That's boxing. That's the National Football League. It doesn't matter. You know, I'd like to have the perfect broadcast as a commentator. It's not going to happen. And if for some reason it did happen, it's not going to happen twice. There, there are go. always little mistakes. We, we all do that. We all aspire to be perfectionists, and, and it's probably unattainable. If you're talking to young referees, if you're training, which you do a great deal of your time, you make a mistake. Do you own the mistake? Do you immediately go to the commission? Absolutely. And, and not to beat up on Erdy because it, his heart was in the right place. He didn't go in thinking, I'm going to sabotage that fight. It mm-hmm. was a bad night. It was a bad performance. There you go. But as you would instruct a young referee, all right, you clearly rule the tap when there wasn't. You can't restart the fight. It's like in nope. court. You can't unring the bell. 
So what is the procedure then as you would train referees? Well, now the procedure, if, if you were Eduardo Hurdy in Brazil or John McCarthy in Brazil or Herb Dean in Brazil or Mario Yamasaki, doesn't matter. If you have something occur in Brazil that you say, I think I made a mistake. And you can call after you've stopped the fight, before you announce the winner, you can go to the commission and say, I want to see an instant replay of that. You can call a time on the on everything that's occurring, go and look at that instant replay, and then if you say, I made a mistake, you can call it a no contest right at that point. You can't get them going fighting again. You know, the fight is over because you're never going to put them where everyone's going to say it's in under the circumstance that we had, it's the same fight. So... The fight's going to be over. It's going to be a no contest, but you handled it the proper way at that point from when you stopped it to watching the videotape, you can make it that no contest. Now, if it, there is no videotape, you don't have the ability to go back to it. Well, then, then you're going to go through the process of going through the athletic commission. But your job as the referee is to be fair to the fighters. That's everything. And you've got to be humble. You've got to have integrity in what you do and what you say. And you have to be honest because there's no doubt when you look at it, you can see what occurred. And you have to look in the mirror every day and live with the fact if you screwed over the fighter. And no one wants to have to look in the mirror every day No one. I didn't do what was right. That, of course, is Big John McCarthy. I'm Sean Wheelock. You have found this, our weekly podcast on MMA and combat sports. Let's get it on. We have a poll question every week, and we answer your questions every week. Email us, whatever you'd like to ask. Info at let's get it on podcast.com. Info at let's get it on podcast.com. As I say every week, you know, I'm completely obsessed with saying names correctly, so please include instructions on pronunciation. That's just what James Bosley did. He sent along a pronunciation instruction guide for his name. Thank you, James. He also sent this excellent question. John, do you see the commissions updating MMA rules anytime soon, such as 12 to 6 elbows and knees to the head of a grounded opponent? Ah, I would tell them. I think that every year they should look at updating the rules. They should always look at what should be done to make the sport better. The National Football League is just coming off of their owners' meetings. There you what go. do they do? They always update their rules. Big, small, in between. They're, every year the competition committee is meeting and saying we need to change the game in these subtle little That's ways. A, and, and part of it is, you know, you can look and there's times when people make calls that the fans are upset with and the referee made the actual right call under the rules, but people don't like the rules. And, you know, there's nothing sometimes that they can do about that. They're making the proper call for what the rule will allow under whatever circumstance it is. But when it comes to, you know, updating the rules, when it comes to certain rules, the 12 to six elbow, you know, someday maybe they may change it. I can't tell you for sure that they will. It's, you know, it's just not a very effective rule as far as uh, the blow itself is not that effective in our sport. And to have it as a foul being that I'm allowed to do it in any position other than my hand going straight up and straight down, you know, it may someday change. But if you look at things like knees to the head of a grounded fighter, I'm telling you, you will never see that change. And the reason you're not going to see it change is you know, there's a liability factor for athletic commissions. And if you want to look... You know, the unified rules, we did that back in April of 2001, and it is now basically almost <clears throat> April of 2015, okay? So we're talking a long term with, you know, fighting under the unified rules. And if you look at the outcome of fighter safety under those rules, it's been pretty stellar over the way the things have happened, you know, the, the safety of fighters, what's occurred in the ring you're not going to see a lot of athletic commissions wanting to change something to what they could possibly make the sport more dangerous, could end up affecting the safety of fighters because as soon as one fighter gets hurt with knees to the head on the ground and they go and, you know, it's near the end of their career and they decide, you know what, I, I, I'm hurt from it. And they get a lawyer because a lawyer is going to want to make money and the lawyer is going to go after the athletic commission and the sport for Oh, you made it unsafe for my client. You know, and this is, a, it's just going to be a money grab, but this is what will occur. And, you know, the athletic commission is going to say, no, I will never open that door so that can occur. I'm not going to let that happen. And so I doubt you're ever going to see anything like 
needs to have a downer fighter and coming back. One of my all-time favorite fights in our sport from Pride, Mark Coleman versus Igor Vovchanchin. I loved Coleman. I love Vovchanchin even more. Coleman wins that fight because of knees to the head of Col a ground. Coleman against Alan Goss. Vovch Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, when the, it, as I was watching the Vovchanchin fight, and I watched it fairly recently within the, about the last month. You're a sick man. <laughs> It's almost, you know, it's almost John. <laughs> true enough. Like, like watching old NFL films where they they're running around with those old helmets. They got that leather helmet. That's exactly. awesome. And, and you know, when you see Coleman burying those knees, you think this would be a completely different sport. Oh yeah. It, it's fun. Or, or when I was writing, is this legal with our Davy? And I went back and I watched the, the entire broadcast eleven thousand times of UFC one, which I still have on VHS, <laughs> and I have my VHS recorder just for writing that book. When Gerard Gordeau, first ever UFC fight, kicks Taylor Tooley in the face as Tooley is seated, you think this is a completely different sport. It's almost shocking in the brutality. You forget those early fights from the 90s, even into the early 2000s. It's a fundamental change of how MMA would be. It's a difference. You know, look at MMA started out as a spectacle. You know, and there's just no other way to be honest about it. It was an infomercial. Gracie Jiu Jitsu was going to prove how it was the better martial art than the others. Don't tell Art Davy that. Dude, Art's you know listening. Well, you know, it's, it's, that was Horian's idea. That was not Art's idea of it. Not at all. But trust me, it was oh, Horian absolutely. Gracie's no, idea no of it. And that's no doubt. why he wanted you know, this thing to, to happen. It, was, it did. It changed his life. It changed his dojo. It changed everything about you know, business for him. You know, it worked. But you can look at it, and that was the way things were, and it was a spectacle. And, you know, look at after UFC 2, when I did that, I told Art, I told her, never, ever will I referee that again. You're going to get someone seriously hurt. And, you know, things started to change from that point, and we started coming up with you know, ways that I could stop the fight, because back then I couldn't stop the fight. And it was, look at this is not a street fight. This is supposed to be a sport. And if we're going to be a sport, you got to go by certain rules. And, and it gets to a point where you've got to draw the line somewhere. And, you know, people talk about pride and, you know, what happened in pride and, you know, oh, the fighters were safe. What people don't understand is there's fights that take place. And when they take place, you see the fighter get hurt. And then the fighter gets up and everyone goes, oh, they're okay. They're not okay. And sometimes they live with the problems that have been brought by that certain blow for the rest of their life. No one sees it because now it's not on the TVs. But we need to try to keep things to a point where fighters are able to come in, compete to the best of their ability. But when they're done with their careers, they can have a normal life. Next question from Germany. And just as a side note, thus far, uh, you've listened to our podcast in 51 countries, which John and I are both really proud of. So Patrick Ingversen in Germany writes, this is a really good question. We oftentimes see fighters defend a takedown attempt by simply grabbing the cage and therefore avoiding the takedown. The most prominent example is the first fight between Jose Aldo and Chad Mendez, where Aldo avoided a slam takedown by grabbing the fence. And a few seconds later, he won the fight. Uh, Patrick continues to write, I always had the idea in my mind that when a fighter defends a takedown by grabbing the fence, the referee should step in and restart it so the fighter who attempted the takedown gets the top position and the one who fouled starts from his back. Makes sense, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Everyone would be really happy with that one. You know, again, and this is you're, – you're looking at things and you're asking questions that, you know, the referees are going, oh, my God, don't do that to me because – you're putting the referee in a position that they're the ones that are altering fights. And the, the fighters are the ones that we want to make the decisions and make the things happen in the fights that has the result of the outcome being correct. Now, there are things that happen in it, like the grabbing of a fence. As a referee, you're looking at it and you're going off of what did it do to affect the fight. People sit there all the time and go, I can't believe that you took, you took a point for grabbing the fence and you didn't even warn them. It's not about the warning. It's the effect that it had in the fight. If someone grabs the fence in a way that turns the position and they end up in a good position on their opponent because of the illegal use of that fence, then the referee should be at least stopping the fight, should be at least standing them up at a minimum. And the fighter would be really lucky if a point's not taken off of their card 
based upon what they did to alter the fight with an illegal action. But there's times when guys will grab the fence. The guy's going for a takedown. The guy grabs the fence kind of. He gets pulled away from it. Boom, they end up on the ground. And people are like, oh, you grabbed the fence. Why, why aren't you taking a point? Because it didn't affect the fight. He got the fight where it was supposed to, where he wanted to take it anyways, even with the grab. So we'll warn him. And we'll tell him, don't grab the fence. And we put it almost in you know that back pocket like you did it once. Don't do this, right? And so you have to be judicious because you can't just take arbitrarily take points in fights in a fashion that is going to affect the fight in a way that now it's the referee determining who's going to win all the time. That's not why we take points. Taking of a point is a serious thing. Guys have to do things that, you know what, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in the fight. They're not, you know, following the rules. They're not attempting to fight in the right fashion. There's reasons to take points, but we want to try to be, instead of, arbitrary about it we want to be in a position to be justified in why we're going to take them at a certain time and it's never going to match up fight to fight there's going to be the times we take it without the warning there's going to be times there's going to be several warnings it just depends on the effect on the fight next question this comes from susan walker a great mma fan Susan writes, I understand that when mixed martial arts first started, they needed to use boxing judges. But now that the sport has been around for so long, how come MMA is still using boxing judges when there are plenty of retired MMA fighters who would be great judges? <laughs> I love that question. Well, look, you're right. You know, in, in, in the beginning, athletic commissions were, were in a position where they had people that were doing boxing. MMA comes along and those boxing people said... I can judge MMA. I can referee MMA. This is a fight. I know the winner of a fight. I know how to referee a fight. You don't see a lot of those people still around. Because the one thing that I will tell you is, you know, I, I referee boxing. I referee kickboxing. I referee MMA. I judge boxing. I judge kickboxing. I judge MMA. And if you want to look at the differences, to, to, to referee boxing the right way is not an easy thing. It takes a lot to do, but you're looking at two tools. You're looking at a left hand and a right hand, and you're looking at two targets. And so there's a lot of rules as far as, you know, can't hit below the, way, the, the hip line. That makes it simple. There's a simple line, and everything below it is low. Well, that's different in MMA because we're looking at this small target, and they're doing knees and punches and kicks all around that target. What most people have figured out is refereeing MMA is – it's just a little bit harder than doing boxing because there's just more elements involved with it. There's more tools. There's more targets. There's more for you to look at. It's not that boxing's easy. Neither one is easy. It's just that, one, you have to have a certain idea about the ground game to be effective in it. And if you don't understand the ground game, you're going to screw up. It's going to be a bad outcome somewhere. And that has forced a lot of the boxing people to say, I don't want to do this anymore. There are still some boxing judges that are out there that, you know, started in boxing that are doing MMA and they're still doing it. And that's fine. But to sit there and think that a fighter is going to be your best judge, that's a that's just an absolute fallacy. I mean, I train I have trained. I can't tell you how many UFC veterans in judging and refing. And some of them are the worst judges you will ever see because they only want to give credit to what they like what they were good at. They don't give credit to the other things. And you look and you try to break it down for them and they just don't get it. And so there are fighters out there that would be fantastic judges. And there's ones, they're going to be horrible. It's just a matter of how open they are to everything. Because what we look at in a fight is not the flash and everything. We go off of effectiveness. How effective was that you know, action, that technique, that the fighter did, how effective was it against their opponent? You know, it doesn't matter how many punches you land. It matters how many punches you land that have a bad effect on the opponent. That's what we're looking for, and that's what we need judges to understand. And for the most part, the judging is getting a lot better. It really is. You can look at – there's some hard fights out there, and there's times people – you know, everything is controversial. You know, put the big C word next to it when there's no controversy at all. It's a very close fight, and it was a split decision. What's that telling you? It's a very close fight. That's just the way it is. 
Outstanding questions. We love to hear from you. Keep them coming every week. Info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, email us your questions. Ask us anything you'd like. Info at let's get it on podcast.com. Still to come on this week's episode of Let's Get It On, John will explain his decision to deduct a point from Demi and Maya in his bout versus Ryan LaFlair last week at UFC Fight Night in Brazil. And we'll look at the issues of timidity and time wasting in MMA. And we'll talk about one of the honest verbal submissions that I've ever seen, which took place at a local show that I attended recently in Kansas City. With Big John McCarthy, I'm Sean Wheelock. This is Let's Get It On. For all of our listeners looking for great new designs in MMA apparel, look to the new clothing styles of Lambs to Lions. That's right, Lambs to Lions has got new styles with old and new put together boxing, MMA, everything, go to lambstolionsbrand.com and check out their line of clothing. It's the book that Wrestling Observer calls a must-read for any MMA fan. Jonathan Snowden of Bleacher Report describes as riveting and amazing, and the fightner.com says nothing is held back. Pick this book up right away. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It, written by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the foreword by John McCarthy, is now available to listeners of this podcast at the special price of $12.48. That's far less than you'll pay for the book on Amazon and half price of what you'll pay in store at Barnes & Noble. Buy it directly from the publisher now online at ascendbooks.com and enter the promo code LEGAL50. That's A-S-C-E-N-D books.com, promo code LEGAL50. Learn the true story of how the UFC came into existence in the book that Randy Couture describes as honest, shocking, and enthralling, and that has a rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars from Amazon Reader Reviews. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the forward by Big John McCarthy. Available now online at ascendbooks.com for just $12.48 when you use the promo code LEGAL50. Hey, this is Sean Wheelock. And this is Big John McCarthy. If you're a fan of our show, then you're going to love the rest of the Ignotainment podcast lineup. Like the Ocho Man behind the eight ball and the Whiskey Philosopher with Jeff Cooper. You can find these great podcasts and more at Ignotainment.com. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the program. Let's get it on! Now, back to Let's Get It On with your hosts, Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. In the main event of UFC Fight Night 62 in Brazil, Demi and Maya defeated Ryan LaFlair by unanimous decision, which, John, you refereed, and it was pretty straightforward. That is until the fifth and final round. Well, you know, the... You watch that fight, and I want I want to I want to say this because it's so. I heard a lot of people go, "Oh, that fight was boring." I thought that fight was phenomenal. You know, I'll just in, I'll interject. If you think that fight's boring, you're not a fan of MMA. Absolutely. You're a fan of Muay Thai. Perhaps. My God, man, Damian my If you watch some of the things, he, his hips, his top control, what he's doing is so good. I mean, I'm watching it, and I'm like. Oh my God, that is so technically strong and good. He's doing things. He's cutting off. You know, look at Ryan Lafleur. Understands he understands how to move. He understands how to get out. This is a guy that can scramble and get out for most people. And he's doing some really good things. And Damian Maya is cutting him off. He's shutting him down. His hip placement, and all of a sudden he takes his knee and slices his knee in and cuts Lafleur's ability to move completely off takes it and puts his foot to the outside. All of a sudden, he's in mount, and he does it over and over and over. It was an absolute, I mean, it was like a symphony of jujitsu. What he was doing was head and shoulders above most guys' levels as far as just the movement of his his hip movement and his placement of, of his body parts to block what LaFleur's trying to do to get out was just incredible. And, you know, the thing was he put a lot of energy out in doing some of those things. And this is the one thing you're looking at. You've got to give Ryan LaFleur his cardio is incredible. 
he had a guy mounted on him. And I, you can sit there, and when you got a guy in guard, it can get tiring with some of his weight. When you got a guy as good as Damian Maya is mounted on you, he feels like a 500 pound gorilla on top of you. It definitely cuts down your your breathing. Your diaphragm's got pressure on it. You're not breathing the same, and you're having to still defend with no offensive ability of your own, really. And he came out of that, you know, into the fifth round where he had exhausted Damian Maya out with the, his cardio. You know, and this is part of fighting. This is when we talk about damage. Damage is not only about a cut. It's not only about a swelling of an eye or something like that. It's about the diminishing of someone's abilities, the diminishing of their spirit, the diminishing of their desire, the diminishing of their athletic, you know, overall ability and their conditioning to the point you make them start to fall off of the cliff because you've pushed them to a, a place where they are physically falling apart because cardiovascularly, they're done, they've broken. And really, that's what occurred going into that fifth round. Maya was exhausted. And in it, you know, Maya is starting to, he's starting to run. He's starting to try to escape the fight by, let me get distance, let me move to try to let the clock go down because I've won four rounds. You know, anyone, you know, knows he had won those four rounds. There was no doubt about it. And so you're watching him start to try to get that clock. You know, the clock was his enemy for that fifth and final round. And it was probably one of the longest five minutes of Damien's life at that point because, He's trying to get away from a guy who's now going after him, but not going after him in the way that he was in the second, third round with too much aggression. And he even started to do it a little bit in the fifth round. But Damien was trying to slow the fight down. And the best way for Damien to slow the fight down was to get it to the ground and to try to soak out some, you know, let the seconds run off. And that's his right. What occurred in the end and what we can't have is the fighters are told in the back, you know, we do not ask questions of fighters during the fight. You can't ask a fighter a question and expect them to fight and answer you. You're making a huge mistake and bad things are going to happen. So we tell the fighters in the back, if you knock your opponent down, you are in control of, your, of the position. If your opponent's on his back and you're standing, if you want to engage, we want you to press forward, showing us that you want to keep them on their back and we will give you time to work. If you decide, I want them up, take steps back away from them, and we will automatically come in between you and make them get up, you're in control of the position. If the fighter doesn't want to get up and tries to start stalling and laying down, that is timidity. That is what we will start to give warnings for, and I gave warnings to Damien, and that is what we will eventually start to take points for. What ended up in the at the end of it, Damien gets, you know, he gets Ryan down again and is on top of him. Then Ryan gets out and he breaks away from him. And Damien ends up being in a position. I tell him to get up. He does get up. And he knows there's only a couple seconds left. And he flops to his back. And what that is, I, I hear people say, he was pulling guard. Well, if you don't understand what pulling guard <laughs> is, pulling guard means you're pulling the person down with you. It doesn't mean you're flopping it on your back. It doesn't mean you're flopping to your back. That is not pulling guard. Where the where this whole concept came from was years ago, back in 1990, I want to say 95, 96, there was a show that was called Mars. And you had a fight between Marilo Bustamante, who was an incredible, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, and Tom Erickson, who was a super heavyweight, 286-pound Olympic wrestler. John, sorry, I just want to sound the nerd alert because not only did I buy that, along with all my early UFCs, I still have that on VHS. <laughs> there as you well. go. We'll go back and you know <laughs> the you big can, cat Tom Erickson. Big cat, you know, and you go back and watch, and what we learned from it was Tom Erickson takes Merlo Bustamante down and is in trouble the entire time he is on top of Merlo and gets to the point he goes, I don't want to be on the ground with this guy, and he stands up. And he's wanting to fight, even though he's really not a good, you know, striker. He's going to decide, I'm going to strike, you know, I'm gonna, I want to box. I want to stand on my feet and punch it out. And Marilla Busamon is looking, going, I got a 300-pound guy in front of me. I don't want to strike with him. And Marillo is on his butt, and we have this position where Marillo starts scooting towards him. And we call it the butt scoot. And we watched and said, you know what? This is bad for the sport. This is not, you know... It's, it's a way of fighting. We're not saying it's not, but we, this is a way of fighting that we have decided 
we can't have because it's bad for the fans and, and it's going to take, you know, things from the fans where they're not going to like our sport. So we decided long ago, all right, you can't be butt scooting towards them. You can't flop to your back to avoid the stand up. You have got to take the fight to the ground. You can take that to the ground by pulling guard, by pulling into a half guard and, and a ton of guys have done it. You know, Damian Maya has done it in fights. He did it against Nate Corey, could not get Nate Corey to the ground with a traditional takedown. He goes and slides into half guard, pulls him down, does a beautiful sweep and gets a submission. Beautiful jujitsu how he does it. But what we have to have is if the fighter is trying to avoid the fight by just flopping to their back, that's timidity. And we have to establish that we can't have fighters avoiding the fight. Your job is to be there for that fight until it ends. If you can't get it to end before that five-minute mark in the fifth round, then you've got to be there fighting at that five-minute mark in the fifth round. On Bellator MMA broadcast on Spike, Jimmy Smith and I have pointed out a number of times where we saw timidity, and we've openly talked about it on the air. But every time that I've seen timidity as a fan, as a spectator, as a commentator, the timidity is towards the losing fighter. To me, this was timidity for the sense of time wasting it was Maya. it absolutely was and i don't blame him you know it, you know he was in a position he knew he was winning the fight and he knows he knows in the from you know me talking to him in the back he knows what's going to happen and it's a it's a calculated thing of you know what this is better than me getting knocked out and losing the fight i'll flop to my back if he takes a point so what well and that's fine you know, he doesn't truthfully know what the judges' scores are. He's, you know, guessing that what they're at. I don't know what they are. All I know is my job is to be fair to both fighters. And when Ryan steps back away from Damien and wants him up and Damien is stalling and getting up, that is unfair to Ryan. My job is to make Damien get up. You know, I hear people all the time, you're so mean. You know, you should ask him <laughs> nice. It's like. My job is not to be nice inside of the ring. My job is to take control and make the fighter do what is the right thing for the sport, what's the right thing for the fairness of the fight. And as that whole thing's going on, you know, I, I warned him several times. And when he finally flopped to his butt, I don't know how much time was left, probably, you know, eight seconds. But it was, hey, you're going to lose a point. And I want other fighters to see you can't do what you're doing. You're going to lose points and they will lose points if they do the same thing. John, you don't need me or anyone clearly to be your defender. However, <laughs> with my very close friends, of which you're one, I have a tendency to be very protective. And when I started reading some of the media members taking shots at you and correctly deducting a point, that really upset me. Uh, because I appreciate it, it was, that, but it doesn't upset me at all because you know what? They don't, you know, media is media. But it's opinion. And some of them, yeah, but see, that's the whole point. They look at it like they know. I know what he should. I know what he can. They don't know nothing. They're clueless. All right. It's as simple as it gets. You know, you can because you can write in a blog or you write on a MMA media website. Does that make you right? If you don't even know half of what's going on, have fun watching the fights. <laughs> have fun criticizing the referee. Go ahead. If you want to criticize, criticize me. I don't care. If you think that that's going to bother me, i got a lot of the things to bother me. Other than that. <laughs> that's not it. My job is to be fair to the fighters. And that's fair to Damien when he's on top and I have fans saying, you should stand him up. No, that's not fair. Fair is Ryan needs to get out from the position because Damien has acquired a dominant position. And he's doing things to try to end the fight. They may not be flashy, but he's doing what we ask of him. But there's fans out there and there's writers that say, oh, it's on the ground too long. Okay, great. That's because you want the fight to be a certain way. This is MMA. We allow them to do a lot of different things. And they know in the back what they need to do to stay on the ground. Damien was doing everything that he was supposed to do to stay on the ground. I'm not going to sit there and be unfair to Damien and stand Ryan up so he can try to knock Damien out. That's not my job. My job is to be fair. But with same thing in reverse. When Damien is trying to avoid the fight because he's exhausted and there's a chance of him being knocked out. That's not my problem. I need to be fair to Ryan. And if that's to take a point, then it's to take the point. And that's what I did. I know that in our listenership of Let's Get It On, we have a lot of MMA, boxing, Muay Thai, combat sports referees. And I guess the takeaway is if John McCarthy is taking heat, well, then don't <laughs> feel so bad. You're all going to take heat. We're all going to take heat. You know, I still referee some boxing. 
and they're always excited. Oh, wow, Sean, the Bellator commentator is here. Two seconds into the fight, you, you suck. suck. <laughs> we hate you. Then afterwards, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. We love you on Bellator. There you go. On Bellator, you're great. Is it right? You know, it's it's the truth, and it's what you know. I tell people all the time. I tell referees all the time. Hey, our job is not to be popular. Our job is not to be for people to like us. If you like me, great. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you hate me, great. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. It's not going to change what I'm going to do. I need to do my job. And if you don't understand my job, that's okay. I don't. That doesn't bother me. But to have an opinion, a perception of what I'm supposed to do, you know, the, the best thing I can tell you, everyone thinks Dana White knows the sport the best. Well, Dana White came and shook my hand and said, that was the fucking greatest call ever. Now, was the greatest call ever? No, <laughs> it was. But you know what? He understood why it was done, and he liked why it was done because these guys are contracted to fight. And when one guy's starting to try to avoid the fight, that's not part of entertainment. And, hey, fighting is about entertainment. You're there. You sign the contract. Your job is two things. Make that wait on the day of weigh-in and come and do your best when you're fighting. But you got to fight, and you got to fight the whole time. Well, speaking of referees taking heed, that segues into our next topic here on Let's Get It On. And, and I'll give a preface by saying that, John, both you and I are huge supporters of local MMA. We encourage everybody listening. Don't just support the big shows watching on TV, buying the pay-per-views. Support MMA. Support combat sports. Man, you know, I, you, the whole thing is you will go and see some of the greatest fights ever on some of these small shows. Some of the you know, people ask me, like, what's the best fight ever? I said, you never would have seen it. Yeah, it's on a small show. And you see things that you wouldn't otherwise see maybe on bigger shows. So recently in Kansas City where I live, uh, because I'm a huge supporter of local MMA, I went out to Phoenix Fighting Challenge. I saw a really— Hold it, the Phoenix Fighting Challenge in Kansas City. That's right. That it's makes the, sense to the me. the rising Phoenix. Not okay, the Phoenix, all right, there Arizona we go. Phoenix. <laughs> So let's set this scene here. This was a really odd verbal submission. So it's Bellator veteran Derek Bohai versus TJ Jones. It's in the heavyweight division. A good friend of mine, Chris Belshi, is the referee. State of Kansas. First round, Bohai takes down Jones. Now, Bohai gets top position. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt, big heavyweight. Starts letting go with some big shots on Jones. Not fight-ending shots, but enough that they're really landing and Jones is uncomfortable. Jones yells out, help me, help me. So Chris Belshi, the referee, immediately stops the fight, rules it a verbal submission. John, you know what happened next. I didn't say that. Pandemo I didn't say that. The score comes over. I was sitting with Adam Rohrbach, the Kansas commissioner. They're lighting up Adam Rohrbach. They're, I'm surprised nobody yelled at me. So it was every, everyone got yelled at but me, thankfully. I was just sitting there watching. Chris Belshi gets yelled at. Adam Rohrbach gets yelled at. The corner is screaming. The argument from T.J. Jones was – I didn't say help me, help me. I said tap me, tap me. Now, I don't know if he was trying to be ironic or hey, funny. Great job of being ironic. Great job of being funny. And you're a freaking idiot. Okay, let's just make this as clear as we can. It, it's crazy, though, because <laughs> rare is the verbal submission in MMA when chaos doesn't ensue. It never ends well because on a verbal sub. Because people don't it's, – it's no different than a referee. A referee makes motions inside of the ring. Why do they make those motions? Why do they take their hands – and wave them above their head. It's to tell the people that can't hear, the fight's over. And those people recognize it. They recognize it as a signal. They say, oh, the fight's over. They know. They say, you know, why is, why is a referee leaning in and tapping their head? Right? They're saying, watch your heads inside, right? They're telling the fans, hey, watch it so the fans understand. Oh, the referee saw it. And that's part of what a referee's job is. But what people don't ever know is when you have a verbal tap, they don't know anything that really occurred. They didn't see a tap. So there's nothing to actually go off of that was a physical act. Someone could go, boom. Even if it's on tape, videotape, you most of the time are not going to hear it. And you don't really see it. And so there's always that little bit of, well, did it really happen? Well, you know, it's as simple as this. If you want to talk during a fight, and there are guys that do, they'll talk to their opponents and stuff like that. Don't ever come up with the word tap. <laughs> tap me, tap me. You're an idiot. It's like okay? words you shouldn't say on an airplane. No, that, exactly. That the you, don't, you, don't, you don't get on a plane and say the word bomb. Okay? You're an idiot. And everything that happens to you, you deserve. Okay? Well, it's the same with this guy. You know, when he sits there and says, whether he said, help me, help me, or tap me, tap me, Chris Belchie did the right thing. Chris took it as you are 
being overwhelmed. You're asking for help. I'm going to give you the help. I'm going to get you out of the fight. And he did the right thing. The fighter can complain all he wants. All the fighter needs to do next time is shut his mouth and fight. There's a, a slippery slope with verbal submissions. I think this is a clear-cut case. But when you have the screams, you have the loud grunts. When I was the commentator in Pride, I did Shinya Aoki versus Brian Lowe and you. And Brian Lowe and you, who was mainly a, a Muay Thai fighter, got caught in a double arm bar. Yep. And I was calling the fights with Frank Trigg, and we're sitting ringside. And he screamed out. Screaming, <laughs> yeah, screaming. But the fight, the fight doesn't stop on that. They continued to let – I think Yuji Shimada – I need to look it up. I think Yuji Shimada was the referee. They continued to let it go. But other times I've heard screams immediately stop the fight. Where do you come on this position? Yeah, well, look at – and this you know, happened to me long ago. And I, I realized I need to be able to tell the fighters. And again, this is when we talk in the back and we're, when people say, you know, what are you saying to the fighters? You're going over the fouls. We're going over about conduct. We're talking about things like – Submissions, what we're going to let them do, what we're going to stop it for. You know, we're going to talk about verbals. If you need out of the fight, you can tell me you know, verbally. You can tap out physically. You can tap you this. You, there's all kinds of ways that you can do it. But we'll tell them in the back, you know, if you get caught in a submission, we're going to let you work your way out of any submission there is. It cannot get to the point where there's damage. Damage is two things. It is not the popping of the arm, even though that hurts. I'm not saying it doesn't. But it's not severe damage in the fact that you can't go on. So damage is if the arm dislocates or the joint that, you know, whatever it is, ankle, knee, shoulder, arm, dislocates, fight's over. Breaks, fight's over. You lost. And we'll tell them, you know when you're caught, don't let it get to that point. Let me get you out of the fight. If you get caught in a submission and you decide to scream like you're all of a sudden a 12-year-old little girl, the fight is coming to an end. That is a verbal tap. You are saying that you have become overwhelmed. We're going to stop the fight. You lose. If you need to, I, I use humor most of the time, you know, if you need to summon the gods of retard strength, <laughs> all right, and you grunt as you're trying, no problem. I will let you grunt all you want. But when you scream out like all of a sudden you have changed sexes and you are about, you know, 15 years younger than you are right now, the fight's over. And and I've had those things happen, you know. I can point out fights where it's occurred. And the fighter, I didn't tap. I said, what did I tell you in the back? And they go, oh, because they know. You've talked about it. Once you talked about it and they agreed, they understand why you're going to do something. That's why you're talking to them in the back so they know exactly. When we say something, people hear it and they think, why is he saying that? But we've told the fighter in the back, when I say this, this is what it means to you. So if we have a fighter that gets in a position where, you know what, he's all of a sudden opening up, he's got a good position on his opponent, got his back, and he starts opening, and this opponent turns his head, and they hit them square to the back of the head. And we go, watch the back of the head. And usually I'll call it to it. So if it's, you know, if it was you, I'd say, Sean, watch the back of the head. Right? That's what the fan hears. What I told the fighter in the back is, when I say, Sean, watch the back of the head, what I'm telling you is, Sean, that was a great punch. It landed in an illegal area because your opponent turned their head, making it legal. So that was a great punch, but I can't have you come with a second one. So I need you to either switch it over to a hammer fist, switch hands, or go into a grappling maneuver. Don't come with a secondary blow because then it is on you, and now you're drawing me into your fight, making me do something about it. John, on the screams, which generally is an involuntary action from a fighter. Involuntary it, meaning what? It, meaning it pops out. Meaning... It pops out. Why? Because of the because pain. they're in pain. But, but it, because they're becoming overwhelmed. But it puts you as a referee in an awkward position because what ninety nine out of a hundred times nine hundred ninety nine out of a thousand times I didn't scream. I grunted. Right? Isn't that what you always hear? And, you now have to decipher. It's an uh, awkward it's situation. Not, it's not a decipher. When someone screams, you know they're screaming. Sure. And you've got to let that grunt. <laughs> All that. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to watch it. And if I watch it go, then I'm going to stop the fight. But I'm not going to stop it off of something that is not a definitive. That was a scream. You were in pain. You were being overwhelmed. You had no idea how to stop it. So you're letting out this scream because you have been overwhelmed. We're going to stop the fight. In my all-time favorite bad movie, Bloodsport, which I know everybody who works in <laughs> MMA, we love Bloodsport. Remember the way you get out is you say Mate. Now, Mate. <laughs> I don't know if anyone is going to yell Mate. And by the, the, the way, the problem was I'd, I'd I would probably mix it up with Namaste. <laughs>
<laughs> by, by the way, Paco should have taken Von Damme in the semifinals. I'm still upset on <laughs> that. Result, high man but loses. If you had a chance to rewrite some of the rules, I'm not saying you say Matei anything hokey, would there be a word that you would put in or an action, or would you leave verbal submissions as they are? Leave them as they are. You can't, you know, because you to sit there and say, you know, pineapple, pineapple. <laughs> That's our safe word, you know. Come on. You know, it's just not going to I wasn't going to play the safe word card. I was going to leave that to you. It's, you know, look, at, we've got to we've got to be in a position where we're there to for the safety of the fighters. And to sit there and to try to come up with one thing, fighters are going to go to a point where, you know, sometimes people tap off of almost it's an instinct based upon their training. They get used to, you know, all sort of, oh, and they, they'll tap. And I've, I've had it in fights where, you know, and they tap and they go, oh, no. Oh, no, you tapped. It's over. Because I made that mistake long ago with Matt Lennon against Marilla Bustamante. One of my worst things that drives me crazy to this day was that I made, I was unfair to Marilla Bustamante. I, I stopped it, and I had Matt saying no, and I was like, oh, my God, I was wrong. And the only thing I could do was restart them in their corners at the time. I couldn't put them back in the same position. That wasn't in the rules. And I hated myself for what I did to Marilla. But these are the things that we deal with, and you've got to make a decision. And you're making a decision based upon the safety of the fighter. And when you hear screaming, you're going to know what screaming is. To sit there and say, I hear a sound, eh, a sound is a sound. Everyone understands what a scream is. And if someone is screaming, it is saying that they have been overwhelmed in the fight. Their brain has stopped working to the point of being a defensive tool and getting them out of something. And they're now screaming out, and we are there to protect them. That's the whole purpose. John, last word on verbal subs. Has it ever gone well for you when you ruled a verbal sub? Has anyone ever not given it back to you? Oh, absolutely. I've had a ton. You know, verbal subs. I've had a ton of verbal subs where, you know, you know guys sit there, you know, tap, 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 tap. Well... He's tapping. Matt you know, Hughes, Matt, Matt Hughes, Matt Hughes George Sampier did the same yeah. thing. I've had it, you know, I can't tell you how many times guys have done that. You know, ow, 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 stop. You know stop, 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 stop. Whatever it's going to be, we've got to be able to let the fighter, you know, get themselves out of a bad situation and to sit there and, okay, you've got to say this word. Mate. You know, yeah, mate. <laughs> Not mistake. <laughs> It's uh, I don't think the one word is, is the answer. As we follow on on this podcast week after week, we've got to do a tribute to blood sport. I just oh, realized that now. It's just horrible. <laughs> just horrible. The greatest bad movie of all time. I know that you agree. That'll be a poll question some week. God. You love, absolutely love blood sport. You must. Do you love <laughs> blood sport or really love blood sport? Well, John and I are back with you next week for a new episode of Let's Get It On. First available on Friday. Our guest will be the great Randy Couture. Download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes store for Android. Download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, let's get it on podcast.com. You can also find us on social media, facebook.com slash let's get it on podcast. Be sure to give us a like. And you can find us on Twitter at podcast MMA for this show. And for us personally, at John McCarthy MMA and at Sean Wheelock. To ask us a question, make a comment, or inquire about becoming a sponsor of Let's Get It On, email us at info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, that's info at let's get it on podcast.com. Thanks to Winstar World Casino and Resort in Thackerville, Oklahoma, where we're broadcasting from for this week's episode. And it's the site of Bellator 135. You can find them online at Winstar World Casino and Resort.com. For John McCarthy, our producer Chris Lakin, and our entire crew, I'm Sean Wheelock. Thanks for listening. This has been a presentation of Ignotainment Media Network, online at ignotainment.com. Let's get it on with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock, only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in the comments section of the iTunes Podcast Store. If you have questions, comments, or are interested in sponsoring the show, contact us at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com or check out our additional lineup of podcasts, including Ocho Man, Behind the Eight Ball, The Whiskey Philosopher, and Youth Baseball Talk at ignotainment.com.